Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, we're back again for the second session of our Encode and SWE Educate series. So today's session is on making your first smart contract using uh, SWE Move. And of course, we have the lovely Cheyenne again coming back to tell us all about it. Um, and I've just been informed to make sure that you all knew where to find the um, series materials. So uh, if you follow this link, um, you can find the materials uh, here, including all of the slides. Um, I know some of you were asking last week, so some of the slides and all of the code. Um, but I think that's pretty much it from me. Um, Cheyenne, take it away. Hello and welcome everybody to the second installment of the ENCODE Club and SWE Foundation workshop series on SWE. So for those of you joining us again, welcome back. And for those of you who are tuning in for the first time today, my name is Cheyenne and I am a DevRel engineer here at the SWE Foundation. So let's get right into it. So today we'll be covering, we'll, be make sure, we'll make sure that everything's installed. So you guys should have received an email prior to this saying that you should have SWE installed by now. But if you don't, that's okay. As Angela said, the code example is on the GitHub, is in the GitHub repo. So if you can't follow along and code with me today, you can just look at it and you can kind of intuit your way through it as well. And so once everything is installed, we will create our first smart contract. So if you have not installed SWE already, please navigate to this link, docs.sui.io slash build slash install to follow all the steps for your particular OS and install any prerequisites and install and eventually install the SWE binaries. Then once you have done that, it, the, the uh, ID we'll be using is VS Code. And in my opinion, the best move syntax highlighter is this one called just move syntax made by Demir, who is an engineer at Miston Labs. And this will be perfect. This will be everything you need to really write SWE code and have it look all pretty. <laughs> so let's jump right into it. Once all the binaries are installed, once you have the uh, syntax highlighter install, installed in a new terminal, enter SWE move new car to create a new package named car. So once you do that, you'll see two items generated a file called move.tumble and a directory called sources. So the main unit of move code is called a package and a package must include these two uh, files slash directories, right? It must include the move.tumble file and the sources directory. So this is a screenshot of the move.file move.tumble file that was just created and it's a screenshot. It shows the package dependencies and metadata. And then the sources directory is where you'll be writing the actual move code. So before we like do anything, before we get to like anything technical, I just kind of want to give a background uh, with respect to the presentation content today. So if you guys were younger, you probably went to an arcade or maybe you don't have to be younger. Maybe you went to an arcade last week. But if you went to an arcade, if you've ever been to an arcade, there is always these car games. And as a child, I love them. Like before I could drive, I mean, because, you know, it gave me that sense of like autonomy, like, oh, like who cares? I'm only 12, 12 years old, but I can actually get a feel for what it's like to drive a car. All right. So at these arcade games, when you were selecting your car at the beginning, you could pick between several cars, right? And every car was some mix of some like variable of like three different stats, let's say, right? So most of them had the three stats of speed, acceleration, and handling. Speed referring to the maximum velocity a car could reach. Acceleration referring to how fast you could reach that maximum velocity. And handling, which refers to how well you can turn, make corners, break, stuff like that. So being the kid that I was, I didn't really care about turning. I just cared if my car went fast or not. So I always picked the car with the highest speed and acceleration. This was great when the track was like straight, but like you guys know, for many times the track was also not straight. There was a bunch of turns and you had to like break and stuff like that. So incredibly poor choice for a kid that's never driven before and didn't care too much about braking. 
but I digress. At least when the track was going straight, I got to go a little fast, right? So before we hop into the actual content, let's talk about objects. So what are objects? The most basic unit of storage in SWE is referred to an object. I like to think of objects as the building blocks of programming on SWE. So in other blockchains, in other blockchains, storage is done via a key value store. But that is not the case in SWE. In SWE, what, what I personally like about it so much is that it just feels so intuitive. So, like, for example, here are some examples of objects. An AMM's liquidity pool, an in-game sword. So if you want to think about, like, let's say you're building an RPG game, right? And we will do this later on in the workshop series, which is why I'm hinting at it now. If you want to equip a sword, you literally just write that in the code that you have this player hero character and it equips this NFT of a sword. And that's why I just think it's so intuitive to wrap your head around. And also the car that we'll be going over in our workshop today is also an object. So you'll see in this little like this screenshot to the left that every object has two things that really make it an object. It has the has key modifier and ID. So the key refers to that it's a key in global storage, meaning that you can eventually write this variable, this object to global storage. And ID UID refers to the unique global identifier that is generated at runtime. And before we move forward, it's also important to note that objects can have four different types of ownership. So objects can be owned by an address. So let's say like I want to like purchase an NFT, like a traditional NFT, right? Like a JPEG NFT. That JPEG literally lives under my address. So when someone looks at my address in the SWE block explorer or SWE explorer, they'll see, oh yes, my corresponding address has this object of this NFT. So objects can also be owned by another object. So for example, like the example I was talking about earlier regarding the RPG, if my player is, let's say my player is called Hero in this game, my player can equip that sword or my player can sell that sword. So that shows that, oh yeah, objects can also be owned by another object. Objects can also be shared, which is, a core concept that we're going to get to later today. A shared object, but for now we can talk about that a shared object is, is not owned by anybody. A shared object just exists in the SWE network and anyone can freely interact with it given the constraints that, given that they satisfy the constraints. And then finally, immutable. An immutable object, as you may intuit, cannot be uh, changed in any way. And the only time, you so it's similar to a shared object, I should say, with, with regards to that, anyone can interact with it, but you can't write to it. So the most you can do with it is to get a read-only reference to it. And if you're confused by what I just said, like, oh my God, do I have to worry about if it's an, owned by an address, owned by an object, whatever? No, you do not need to worry about what goes on underneath the hood and how transactions can handle these things. And that's partly why yeah, that's one of the biggest reasons I should say uh, why I'm so bullish on SWE. Because like prior to this, I talked about this in my intro last time, but you know, like I genuinely thought smart contract development was hard. You have to like like think about so many small details, like cover a bunch of memory, like go through a bunch of memory management, but SWE abstracts this away from the smart contract developer. So you can just focus on writing the best app that you can think of. Because ultimately our goal is to onboard the next billion users onto Web3. If the dApps that we're creating are like super difficult and like super like concise and particulate, particular, I don't think we're going to get there. But I legitimately do think that due to Sui's novel object-centric programming model, it's just easier for us to intuit and wrap our head around this. So yeah, let's go through some act the real code now. So here's the first snippet of the car code. And again, you can find this on the GitHub repo. So let's go through everything first. So at the very top on line one here, you'll see module car double colon car. 
So module just refers to the fact that it's a smart contract. The first car is the package name. So earlier when we typed in SWE move new car, that first car is this package name. And the second car is this particular module's name. And importing modules, I should add, is similar to Rust double colon notation. So if you've uh, played with Rust or you've actually programmed in Rust before, this should be super common. This should be you should be getting deja vu right now, and for good reason. Then let's take a look at the next line. On line three, we have this use import. What we're doing here is that we're importing the object, we're importing object from the SWE standard library. And this allows us to instantiate and manipulate objects. Then let's take a look at the actual struct car. So I should go beyond and add that it's not just a struct, right? It's an object because it has the two things we talked about earlier. It has the has key annotation and it has the unique identifier as the first field. So you might be worried if you, you might be thinking, what does this has key mean? And yeah, like I explained earlier, it allows us to write this variable to the blockchain. It essentially says, okay, or to the SWE network, I should add, it's going to say that, oh, this car will exist on the SWE network in some capacity. And then besides key, there are three other fields that I'll briefly go over as well. And they are store, copy, and drop. Store essentially refers to the fact that you'll be able to store this variable, this struct inside another object, inside another object. So for example, if we had struct car has key comma store, it means that, okay, so this car can live independently on the block, on the suite network as a top level object, and it can also exist inside another object as well. Copy and drop refer to the fact that you can uh, duplicate slash delete that struct respectively. So with traditional blockchains, for example, we want to uh, create something we want to like emulate financial something financial right we don't want to accidentally create nor destroy money out of thin air but sometimes we do want to copy slash delete other fields right so the fact that we have copy and drop is just like another signifier that says to the compiler okay don't throw an error if you are comp copying this or deleting this you're doing it on purpose so just another check so with that said, let's take a look at how we actually instantiate this new car object. Voila. So first we need to, you'll see at the top that we have this uh, use uh, import. And essentially what this does, this transaction context is how you pronounce it, is that it is, what transaction context does, it's a privileged uh, uh, object and essentially it just gives us information about the transaction that we're currently executing. And this is, again, something that's like done underneath the hood. You don't have to worry about it. But nevertheless, the biggest thing to take away is that anytime you want to instantiate a new object, you need to pass in a mutable reference to this transaction context. And as you can see, it's the fourth uh, argument to this function, context, CTX, colon, and mute transaction context. And yeah, so... If it didn't add, yeah, it, uh, what it does is it essentially adds, uh, essentially gives us information about the transaction right now. And it's what is used to generate that unique uh, ID for that car. So before we talk about the rest of the function, let's also talk about function visibility modifiers. So as you can see, this function called new is just a fun, it's just a normal function. But there are other uh, visibility modifiers, like I said, that you can add to it that enable you to do different things with this function. So for example, if we were to highlight this or annotate this with public, if it was a public function, it means that anybody could call or import this function into another module. If it was a public friend function, it means modules that we give specific permission to can use this function. And entry functions refer to the fact that if it was an entry, entry functions can be called directly, like in a transaction. So for example, let's say we're making an AMM, right? Uh, if our swap function for this AMM would have to be a public entry function. It has to be public because anyone has to be able to interact with this function, right? That's kind of the whole point of a decentralized exchange. It has to be an entry function because 
you're actually calling that transaction. And it's a function, well, because it's a function. Oh, and one thing to mention is that entry functions cannot return anything. So again, taking a look at this particular function, new, it's returning the car object. So once we call new, it returns this object. And if it were to be an entry function, like if right now, if we were to just write entry fun, it would throw an error because it's returning this car object. And then, yeah, in order to instantiate this object, this car object, we just do three things. We do two things, right? We pass in the three traditional arguments of speed, acceleration, and handling, and the mutable reference to the transaction context. And as you can see, we just instantiate the new car just like that. And one thing to note is that you'll see that for the ID field on line five, just ID object double colon new transaction context. Because again, you need that transaction context, the mutable reference to that transaction context in order to instantiate a new unique identifier. So let's go to this next function. So if we think about the last slide, it doesn't really do anything, right? We instantiate that new car and we return it, but so what? We're not really doing anything with it. So what we want to do now is to give that new car some meaning. So what we do is we, essentially what this does is now we transfer it to the person calling or the address calling this function, right? And that's done via transaction context, double colon sender, which is the address of the person calling the function. And this is simply a naming convention that constructors are named new and then entry functions are named create. So as you can see, the arguments are the same, except that now we kind of like simplify the code a little bit and we just say, okay, new actually instantiates that car and create both uses new to instantiate it and then transfers it via transfer double colon transfer to the address. So as you can see, this function transfer double colon transfer is directly from the, is from the SWE uh, standard library. The first argument is the object. So in this case, the car. And the second argument is the address. And it, it might look a little complicated. It might look a little weird. Oh, transaction context, double colon sender. It's just you, the person calling this function. Like an, another thing we could have done, we could we could have said let like user equals like on like the first line of this function, we could have said let user equals transaction context double colon sender, and that would just be another way to like look at it. But moving forward, and you'll see too in a bunch of code examples that we don't usually like to write uh, let user equals or let sender equals. It's kind of assumed that this is just the sender of the function. So okay. Now let's say we want to transfer this car to someone, like a friend. Let's say we wanna give this car to a friend. Or let's say we want to trade it or we wanna like list it to a marketplace or whatever. We have to create our own function called transfer. And this has to be a public entry function. And the two arguments are going to be a car. We're passing in the actual car itself and the address of the recipient. And then simply, uh, You'll see the next line. All we do is just transfer, call transfer double colon transfer the object to the recipient. So you might be asking, why do we need to do this? Why can't we just call transfer double colon transfer ourselves? And that is because transfer double colon transfer, again, from the SWE standard library, is not a public entry function. And then you might ask, why isn't the public entry function? And it's because it's just an additional layer of security for protocols or games to allow their users to transfer assets as they see fit. So for example, if one protocol wants to like, create like a soul bound NFT or a soul bound token, they wouldn't have this transfer function. They wouldn't allow their users or like the recipient of that soul bound token to be able to like, willy nilly give it to someone else, which is why the smart contract developer, which is you guys one day, if you're not already, will have to manually create this function yourself if you want to give that ability to transfer objects freely. So let's talk about like other potential functions we can write, right? So this following get stats function is just a simple getter function that only takes in the car object as a read only reference and returns its respective values. And also similar to Rust, you can access an object's fields using dot notation. 
So as you can see, it's just returning three U8s, self.speed, self.handling, and self.acceleration. We could call it self, car, whatever, right? So let's take a look at like another example. So let's say in this game of ours, we can like take our car to a body shop to get some modifications done. And you might ask, how can we demonstrate this in Sui Move? Super easy. So if you look at the last slide, we passed in car as a read only reference because that's literally all we're doing. We're just reading the values, right? But here, if we want to actually modify or mutate that, you'll pass it as a mutable reference. And as you can see in the first function, for example, upgrade speed, it's just going to take, it's going to be self.speed equals self.speed plus amount. So it's going to be the current amount by which the current speed plus how much you want to increase it by. Super easy. Super, again, it's super straightforward, which is why I love Sui Move so much. So just to recap, what do we learn in these past few slides? We learned that SWE utilizes an object-centric programming model and that objects represent ownership. I think that's one of the biggest, if you're going to take away one thing, like this entire lesson, is just to think of objects as representing ownership. Biggest takeaway, I would say. So with that said, let's now take a look at another smart contract example. So in that same sources directory, create a new uh, file called car underscore admin dot move and populate it with these following lines. So you'll see that, we'll, well, let's go through some like weird things that we see now, right? So a common pattern in SWE move is referred to a capability, admin, admin capability, cap for short. So what, what does this admin capability do? So it's in the name. What does capability mean in English, right? If I have the capability to do something, if you have the capability to do something, it essentially means that you have like the ability to do something, right? You have like the priv you have a privilege to do something special. So you can imagine that whoever has this admin capability has admin privileges essentially. And the next thing you'll see is that we have this init function down below. And this init function is super important because it's not like any other function. Anytime you see in a function called fun, just fun init, meaning it's not a public function, nor is it an entry function, and it only has one uh, variable, it only has one argument, the, trans the mutable reference to the transaction context, it's a special function that is only a uh, called at when the module is published. So this function in it will only be called one time and it's called as soon as this module is published. So what are we doing in this uh, function? As you can see, we're calling transfer double colon transfer. We're instantiating a new admin capability object and we're sending it to the sender, which in this case is the person publishing this module. So why does this combination make sense? Why this? Because this is something you're going to see a lot and you'll probably use a lot in your code. So like, why does it make sense? So as we talked about earlier, admin capability is, or admin capabilities are like the right, or like the, yeah, the right for an admin, someone important to do something that other people cannot, right? So if you want, if you, if only you want to be the admin, what you want to do is you want to protect that by only ensuring that only one admin capability will ever exist. And this is what this init function does. It creates that new admin capability object and sends it to you. So this is why this is a combination that you're going to see a lot. And we'll talk about how you can actually use this admin capability in your code. And look no further than the next slide. So let's uh, go back to, if we think about the previous create function, what's different? Only one thing is different, right? It still has the same other four arguments of speed, acceleration, handling, and the transaction context. But you'll see that the first argument is just an underscore and a read-only reference to admin capability, even though body function is the same. But what does this mean? So one thing to note in, is that in SWE move, anytime you want to ensure that the compiler doesn't throw an error because you didn't use the variable by the end of the function, is you want to prefix it with an underscore. 
So in our example, we're just leaving it as an underscore, but it could be something about like underscore admin cap or whatever. But like I said, it doesn't matter. Just leave it as an underscore and that's going to be fine. This function is essentially saying that, okay, we're not using the admin capability, but the address calling this function needs to have it, right? Because we're not using admin capability anywhere else in the code. We're just saying the user needs to have it. So what does this mean? So let's say I'm the module publisher, right? Can I call create? Can I call this create function? Yes, because when I published the module, the admin capability was transferred to my address. But can you guys call this function? No. So only I can now call this create function and only I can transfer cars to myself. So this is kind of a, a meaningless function, right? Because you kind of want other people to be able to create cars. But this is just one way that you can use this admin capability as like an admin type privilege. So quickly recap, capabilities can use to get admin access for functions. If you want to do something that you don't want anyone else to be able to do, or you don't want everyone to do, you would use a capability. So like in our example, we created only one admin capability, but there's nothing stopping you from like creating other admin capabilities via other functions. Like, but that, again, that was just one example. So let's take a look at our third and final example. So again, in the sources directory, create a new file called car underscore shop dot move and populate it with the following code you see below. And if you don't want to manually populate it, lucky for you, it's on GitHub. Just to remind you guys again. So you'll see that pretty much like everything is the same, right? But we have this error code on line 10, insufficient balance. And we have this new object. Remember, it's an object because it has because it has has key and ID as its first field on line uh, 10 of this example. So before anyone could mint a car for free, right? Anyone could like instantiate this new car object for free. But now it's going to cost you some cold, hard sweet. And let's take a look at how we can model this. So let's look at our init function first. So our init function does two things now, as you can see. It, like in the previous example, it just minted that admin capability, but now it does the same thing. Instead of, but instead of calling it admin capability, we're calling it the shop owner capability and yeah, it instantiates it and uh, transfers it to the module publisher. And as you can see, it instantiates this new car shop object. So let's talk about the fields quickly. It has ID, because it's a new object, the price, this is gonna be the price of a car, and the balance. So this balance is just going to be instantiated at zero. So like I said previously, the init function is a great way to create your capability because if you only want one of it to exist, this, this ensures that only one of it will exist. And similarly, the init function is also a great place to instantiate any shared objects you have. Because in our like, game or our DAP, for example, we don't want anyone to create their new car, their own car shop. We just only want one. And this uh, ensures that that's the case. So now if we want to buy a car, like I said, it's going to cost us some money. So let's take a look at these the this function's arguments now. So it takes in a mutable reference to the car shop, right? Because we're ultimately increasing its balance. It takes a mutable reference to the payment. So that's going to be the number of amount of SWE in your wallet. And again, the transaction context, because it is creating a new car object and minting it to the sender. To the sender. So you see the first line is just a simple assertion. Assert that the value of the payment of the coin is greater than or equal to the price of the coin. The, sorry, the price of the car. So that's essentially saying, it's a long way of saying, of making sure that you have at least greater than or equal to the amount of sweet in your, in your balance than is the price of the car. And then before we take a look at the next few lines, let's take a backtrack and look at some of uh, the SWE standard library's APIs. So these two snippets are from 
the coin dot move and balance dot move from Swiss standard from the Swiss standard library. So coin, as you may kind of into it, it's similar to an ERC twenty token, like a fungible token. And you'll see that it has key and store. So what does that mean? It has key, meaning it's going to be written to the SWE network, right? And it has store because it can be stored inside of another object. So like a good way I like to think about that is like, let's say you have, let's say you have a game, right? You can, if you want to like play with like actual SWE, like real SWE, you can also include a field in like your hero's, uh, in your hero's, one of your hero's values can also be like coin, right? Or it could be something like, or it would make sense to be balanced. And we'll get to that in a second. But essentially you can make it so that your actual character in your game can like own a sweet. So essentially says that you can store this coin inside an, ab an address or another object. And then one thing you'll also see is that there is a phantom type parameter that struct coin phantom T. What does that mean? So it essentially allows anyone to be able to create this generic coin of type T. And that might be a little confusing, but so let's take a look at an example. Let's, let's like talk about another example. So like, let's say you want to program an AMM, right? In an AMM, you want to be able to allow users to permissionlessly deploy new pools. So what that would look, it would look something, if you want to create that pool object, it would look something like struct pool angle bracket, phantom A, phantom B has key because you want to allow the user to be able to swap between any two coins permissionlessly. So with that said, now let's take a look at balance. So essentially, we what we say is that coin is a wrapper around the balance struct. Why is it a wrapper? Because if you look down there on the, the bottom screenshot, you have this balance struct and notice how I said struct and not object. I said struct and not object because balance only has store. Balance, like this balance value cannot be written directly onto like the SWE network. It has to exist within some other object. In this case, it's our coin. So what we say is that coin is a secure wrapper around balance because coin takes in balance as one of its values. So you might also ask, why is it the case? So the reason is that is we allow this lower level API balance and it can be used for many things, including custom coin types and bypassing traditional constraints that we have on coin. And when I say coin, I'm referring to the SWE standard library coin. So some examples include, if you call a function, if you call the function balance double colon create supply, it does not require a one-time witness, which is something we'll cover in a future workshop, unlike coin, double colon, create currency. Balance can also be used to create custom coins with a different logic, such as regulated coin, which is an example of a coin that, think of like USDC, right? If we want to be able to blacklist a certain address because like, but let's say they were involved in something fraudulent, right? We could use the logic and regulated coin, which again is in the SWE uh, repo on GitHub. And the last thing is that balance does not have an ID. So it does save a small amount of space when it is wrapped, for example, in our shop balance. And then again, before we look at the rest of the of our function, these are a snippet. Uh, this is a snippet of coin.move from the SWE standard library. So as you can see, these are just simply several functions used for manipulating coins and balances and going back and forth between the two. So if you look at line um, 10, yeah, line 10 of this example, sorry, nine, line 19, bad eyes. If you look at line 19 of this example, you'll see coin double colon from balance. Essentially, what does that do? It takes, it's in the name, right? It takes a balance and wraps it into a coin from balance into a coin, right? And yeah, just the one thing I'd like to add is that if you really want to like up your SWE, I would definitely go through all like the, not all of them, right? But like some of the more relevant ones, like definitely coin and balance. A bunch of the files in the SWE standard library, just to know what you can do to really 
either like take your code to the next level or to like kind of like create your code in the first place, right? Because a lot of these functions are like, I would say essential. Yeah, they are essential in writing SWE move code. So I definitely recommend all devs to go through the SWE standard library. So let's take a look at our, uh, let's go back to our buy car function and let's take a look at the middle three lines again. So line four of this example, we take this mutable reference to balance. What we do is because as you can see in the function argument, we pass in coin. We pass in a mutable reference to coin SWE or SWE balance. Line four, what that does, it essentially takes that balance and unwraps, it, sorry, it takes that coin and it unwraps it and gives us the balance. So, and that's coin balance, aptly named, right? Then the next line, line five, it takes that balance above and it splits it. It takes a sub balance and sets that equal to paid. So as you can see, we take that the first argument to balance double colon split is the previous coin balance and it just sets it equal to the shop price. Because if the car, if it, let's say this car is 100 SWE, we just want that 100 SWE. And then the last line of this, the balance lines, right? Line seven, it adds that sub balance we just took and adds it to car shop. So if we go back to car shop, yeah, right here, you'll see on line 22, you'll see that um, that balance field balance SWE just refers to the amount of SWE it has, right? So, yeah. And then the rest of the code is pretty straightforward. It's nothing we haven't seen before, right? It creates a new car object and it sends it to the address calling this function. So, if you were here for the first presentation, you also uh, might have heard me talking about objects and transactions, and like uh, owned objects versus shared objects, and simple transactions and complex transactions. So let's do a quick recap of the four. When I have a car in my address, owned by my address, it's an owned object. If I have that same car and I send it to another address, it's a simple transaction. Why? Because it's not really interacting with anything special, right? I have a car in my balance or in my account, in my address, and I want to send it to someone else. Okay, it doesn't really interact with the rest of like the sweet world, right? But if we take a look at the car shop, as we discussed earlier, the car shop is a shared object. Who owns the car shop? I don't, you don't. Anyone can interact with it. It doesn't belong to any address the same way that the car either belongs to my address or your address, right? It just is there and anyone can interact with it. Thus, the car shop is a shared object. And then um, when I call by car, because I am ultimately interacting with this shared object, it will go through SWE's consensus. But like I said, because in another example, if I'm just like sending you that object, if I'm sending you the car, not the car shop, but the car, it's a simple transaction because I'm just sending it to you, no problem. But because in this function, by car, I am interacting with the shared object, it will be subject through SWE's uh, dual consensus engines of uh, Narwhal and Bullshark, right? So that's just a quick recap. And again, if you're confused by this, it's okay. It is kind of confusing to wrap your head around, but again, I want to re reiterate that this stuff happens underneath the hood and is not something you actively need to take into consideration while programming unless you want to like optimize your code. But for the most part, you can kind of like leave this on the back burner. And if you're starting out, you definitely should. It's not worth getting into the details at such an early stage. So this is the final function of the workshop, collect profits. So Similarly to the previous function that required a capability, what does this real world scenario represent? So if I have a car, like a, in real life, let's say I have a car shop, right? Like a car dealership. Anyone can enter my store, but only I can do some things, right? That I don't want others to do. And one of them is to be collecting the profits, right? Let's say I have a killer month. I sell a thousand cars. Do I want you to be able to take the money I made? No, of course not. 
So as you can see, similar to the previous function that where we had the admin cap, we have it, we have it uh, used as an argument as just an underscore, underscore and shop owner cap. This is just to say, okay, the only person that can call this function or the only people that can call this function is if they have this shop owner cap. And because the only time in this code example, the shop owner cap, the only time this shop owner cap is created is with the init function. So we're essentially guaranteed that there's only one shop owner cap and it is and it belongs to the person that published this module. And then the rest of the code is pretty straightforward. As you can see the on line two, it says let amount equals balance double colon value uh, and shop balance. It just takes um, that amount that the shop balance has accumulated and kind of says, okay, here it is. And then the next line takes that into a coin. It like uh, transfers it into a coin. And because you need to, the only, the only way you can send, you can't send a balance over to an address because balance is not an object. Because see in this next line, transfer double colon transfer, we have we can only transfer objects, which is why we need to wrap that balance up into a coin and then send it to uh, the transaction sender, which is the module publisher. And then finally to recap, shared objects can be accessed by anyone, like we just saw in the car shop, anyone could use it. And that interacting with shared objects is now again, subject to consensus. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Here is a bibliography slash further reading if you're interested in diving more into how the SWE network works. And before we end, let's take a look at what we have next. So next week, February 22nd, which is my birthday, at the same time, we'll have our third workshop, Intro to SWE Objects and Creating Your First NFT Project in SWE Move. So that's next week, my birthday, don't forget. <laughs> and also, uh, we have uh, the SWE Denver Builder House. So running from February 28th to March 3rd is our first builder house of the year, the Denver Builder House. If you'll be in Denver, feel free to sign up. Spots are limited, so if you are going to be in town, sign up ASAP. This will be a great way to meet a bunch of the team at Miston Labs and the Sweet Foundation. And then to close it off, here is, uh, the QR, here is a QR code to a survey. This survey is super important because we're going to use it to collect feedback and hopefully make future presentations better. I'm human, I make mistakes. Please point out those mistakes to me. If I had any, if I did a good job, please write that too. But yeah, essentially, we just want to use this feedback to ensure that these future workshops are going to be as best of a use of a time for you as possible. I'd like to open the floor now to questions. It says, how do we deploy the contract? This is something we'll talk about in the next, uh, yeah, there we go. So how do we deploy the contract? This is something that we're going to cover in the next workshop. Um, and then, yeah, Tufan's next question was, Tufan's a bunch of questions, awesome. Will there be a common contract shared object for minting NFTs? Because you know NFTs need some standard, at least the metadata, or does SWE want to change this completely? So if you, took it, if you take a look at the SWE, so in the next session, we'll actually cover like creating our own NFT, right? But right now, there is like some like rudimentary code online. Not it's not rudimentary, it is complete, but there is some code online in like the SWE repo that talks about um, creating your own um, NFT. And with regards to like standards, this is something that's being actively debated in the SWE community. There are several teams creating standards and yeah, in my opinion, it's just a matter of what does the community want to see? Does SWE have something like transaction simulation? Like, can we see how will our balance change if we sign the transaction? So there's, there are tests. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. But for example, we do have tests where like you can actually like, test a module and say like, okay, let's say I mint 100 SWE to myself, buy a car for 50 SWE, in the next transaction, after that transaction, I should have 50 less SWE in my account and a car, right? So 
it would look something like that. Can you please explain the phantom T generic parameter in coin phantom T? This is a great question because it's something I struggled with and I kind of like still have questions about it, you know? So yeah, so th this is the slide, right? So struct, you'll see struct coin phantom T has key store. So this phantom T essentially refers to the fact that anybody can be able to create their own coin. Anybody can like, like, and like I said, it's analogous to an ERC20 token. Anyone can like, create their own token just by using a few lines of code. This phantom T is here because you want this coin to be generic. If this phantom T didn't exist, it would only refer to one coin called coin. But because we have phantom T, it just refers to the fact that it can be any coin. Anyone create their own, can create their own coin. And you'll see that the second field has balance T because it has to be the same. The balance also has to be the same type as the coin. If we have like, let's say um, coin A, I'll just call it coin A, right? If we have coin A in our balance, coin A has to be a wrapper around balance A. So... Um, the phantom in this example just refers to the fact that it can be any generic coin. And like I said, if you think about an AMM, the struct declaration in the AMM would look something like phantom A comma phantom B because you want to be able to swap between any two coins permissionlessly. If it was just AMM, like no phantom whatever, it would have to be like a predefined uh, swap and creating that like function for like every single pair manually is a huge pain, if not impossible, which is why we have the phantom type parameters. What if we have a simple if check that checks the caller ID instead of using capabilities? Yeah, that's possible, but you would have to hard code that address in, right? Because like, let's say you're the admin, you have your own particular address. You would have to say something like, um, it would look something like if, address is not equal to this abort right use sui double colon transaction context self transaction context the self indicates a struct car or module car car this is a good question so let me go back to that slide or like one of the slides that has it right oh, like this slide for example right so you can see on line eight we have the import use sui double colon context double colon self comma transaction context. So the first self refers to the actual uh, transaction context import. So we're utilizing functions from uh, transaction context. So neither. You asked if it indicates the struct car or module car, double colon car, neither. It indicates that you're importing, you're using the rest of the imports from the transaction context module, which again, is on Swiss GitHub, is, is in Swiss GitHub. Pavel asks, if we talk about objects, is there any chance that object may lose the owner? Like direct reference, the wild pointer in C++, how can we avoid it? I can imagine a situation that there may be a situation that object is not referred, but memory still exists and we can mess with it. So again, this, again, one of Swiss high points is that this will never happen, that Swiss under the hood, we will check if the an object exists where it should or where it shouldn't. So it'll make like losing objects randomly almost impossible, and it, it won't happen accidentally. You'll have to like actually like, purpose. Like, you'll you have to like delete the object. You have to call a function that deletes that object, and we can talk about that in the next um, uh, session. Okay. So Z asks. If we like to check against multiple permissions, do we do you have a long list of underscore colon x parameters? Yeah, that would be like one way to do it, right? But if you are being um, more like meticulous, there's more meticulous ways to go about it. Is there any limit of data we can store on chain? So let's say we store car name U8 1024. Will we pay for it or how does it work? I mean, of course it costs, but who pays? So yeah, you would pay, like, it's not free, right? If that was the case, people would, like, Sybil blockchains, right? They would use, like, nefarious ways to clog up blockchains. So yes, so 
I guess the first question is yes, there is an upper limit to data that like you can store not on chain but in one object. So there's an upper limit to uh, sizes of objects. I don't know what it is at the top of my mind. It's like changing, and yeah. But yes, you would have to pay for it, and that's gas, right? Anytime you have to pay for like a certain transaction on chain, it costs gas, and you have to foot the bill, not me. If there are no further questions, I would be, I think that was a good time to stop, give you guys six minutes of your time back, and yeah, see you guys next week.